You've got questions? O'Reilly Auto Parts has answers. Need a pro you can trust? We've got that too. No matter what you need, our professional parts people have the training and expertise to help you do things right. Deep automotive knowledge. Just one part that makes O'Reilly stand apart. The professional parts people. Oh, 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 O'Reilly. Auto Parts. Hi, everyone. I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Welcome to Yoga, Birth, Babies, a podcast produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. We will be diving into everything prenatal yoga, birth, and baby-related, hoping to inspire, educate, and empower you through your journey into motherhood. Thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Deb Flaschenberg, and I'm your host of Yoga Birth Babies. And today we're talking about two of my favorite birth methodologies. We're talking about spinning babies and birthing from within. And in full disclosure, I am currently doing my parent educator uh, certification of spinning babies. And several years ago, I embarked on the birthing from within mentor program. So it's something that's near and dear to my heart. And I truly believe in these two methodologies. So it's exciting to have this conversation with Jamie Mose about how we can use these two seemingly different methodologies that actually have a lot of underlying similarities as we approach childbirth education and how parents can use a lot of this thinking, a lot of these principles, and apply it to their birth. It's really exciting about how process-focused both these methodologies are instead of just outcome-focused. So Jamie has a lot to say about this, and I'm really excited for you to hear it. But before we get to that, let me tell you a little bit about Jamie. So Jamie Mose has been serving the San Diego community as a massage therapist body worker for over 20 years and started attending births as a doula in 2009. She is a mother, birth story listener, certified birthing from within mentor and facilitator, and a spinning babies aware practitioner and instructor. She's the creator of Dance's approach to prenatal body work and birthing from within's touch from within course. A co-author with Nicole Morales, who's also a past guest on Yoga Birth Babies, an illustrator of the Breach release, Opening Pathways for Midwifery and Prenatal Body Work, and co-creator of the Spinning Babies online course, Breach for Parents and Practitioners. Jamie is a delight to talk to. She has such in-depth knowledge about both these methodologies and how they can serve and support you as a pregnant person, but also I think this is going to speak a lot to birth workers as well. So I'm really excited for you to hear this conversation. Before we get to that, let me just give you a little update of all the fun going ons at Prenatal Yoga Center. So, oh my gosh, we have so much bubbling up. So we now have, we added some in-person classes. So if you're in the New York area, we have in-person classes six days a week, and we also have online classes seven days a week. So no matter matter where you are, I have a prenatal class that can support and serve you. So you can check all this out on our website, prenatalyogacenter.com. And we've got our postnatal classes and we have our on-demand birthing classes and parenting classes and infant massage. We've got a whole slew of classes in our library for you. So check that out. Now, while you're on the website, grab your free downloadable, Five Simple Solutions to the Most Common Pregnancy Pains. And you know I say it every time, it can also apply to postpartum because let's face it, your bodies get achy. So grab that. So if you can't make it to class, you at least have your cheat sheet for ways to feel better. Now I've had people asking me about our teacher trainings. What are we going to be doing? So as I'm recording this, we actually start our in-person teacher training tonight. I know you're not going to hear this for a while, but it is starting tonight in the actual time that I'm recording that. It's going to be our first in-person teacher training in two and a half years. I'm beyond thrilled. Now we also have our online training and what's exciting is our upcoming training, our November and December has people from all around the world. We have someone tuning in from Dubai, two people from South Africa. We have someone joining us from Germany. It is amazing to know that our training is now reaching beyond our 
our area that we were first serving. So if you're a yoga teacher and this methodology excites you, I would love to work with you so you can bring prenatal yoga centers approach to your community. Check all that out again on our website. All right. Last thing I just want to remind you about is if you have a topic I haven't covered, or maybe I covered it, but you want a different perspective, or maybe you have a speaker that you think would be a fantastic fit for yoga birth babies, reach out to me and tell me. I really do follow through to the best of my ability to honor your requests. So reach directly to me. You can reach me at deb at prenatalyogacenter.com. And either myself or Renee, our amazing operational manager, we will address that and we will do our darndest to find the best speaker to address your request. Okay. We're going to take a super quick break. And when we come back, please enjoy my conversation with Jamie. Got questions? O'Reilly Auto Parts has answers. Need a pro you can trust? We've got that too. No matter what you need, our professional parts people have the training and expertise to help you do things right. Deep automotive knowledge, just one part that makes O'Reilly stand apart. The professional parts people. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts. Hi, Jamie. How are you? Hi, Deb. I am so excited to be here. Yay. I know, as we were talking about before we were officially recording, I love spinning babies. I love birthing from within. So as much as this is about sharing with the community, I this is kind of about me too. I'm so excited to, to talk about how we can <laughs> meld these two really interesting methodologies together. So thanks for letting me pick your brain for a while. Oh, definitely looking forward to it. Yeah. <laughs> so let's dive in. Right. Let's see. Let me learn a little bit about you and how did you end up in the birth world? Yeah, I was contemplating and feeling into how I wanted to, you know, share my connection with birth. How did I, how did I get interested? We all have interesting origin stories. And I was reflecting back to, I think it was when I was 12 years old and my cat was in labor on my bed in the middle of the night and give birth to kittens right next to me while I was petting her and she was purring and she'd have her contractions. And I'm like, whoa, (laughs) birth is really cool. (laughs) Um, So having had that initial initiation into what was possible around birth, um, my life went in various directions, as many of ours do, and I came to doing body work, so massage therapy and body work in 2001, um, and then started to just sort of specialize in working with people that were pregnant, and then had my own child when I was 2007. That's often a portal into the birth world for a lot of us when our own children are born, and um, yeah, then... <laughs> as many people do, hit this gate of great doubt in their journey around being a birth worker, being in birth, be it if you're, you know, attending births or doing education around birth or just doing prenatal movement classes, like whatever it is, right? We come to this, this, I want to say come to Jesus moment, you know, for those that that resonates with, um, where we're just like, I don't know if I can do this anymore. And I would, I had been attending births for a few years And I was noticing that I was taking on a lot of the um, little T and big T traumas that my clients were experiencing because the system of birth, which many of us recognize as um, problematic at best in many ways, um, was just creating the, the, the context for birth violations and obstetrical violence, you know, to happen. Um, and I was just, witnessing these and, and doing my best, of course. And and my clients were telling me they were glad they were there, but there was this like sense of failure. Like I'd failed my clients if they didn't have the birth that they envisioned. Um, and we're often, I think (sighs) with quotes, like, you know, a doula decreases your chance of having a cesarean with that kind of kind of statistic. I think that can also put a lot of pressure on birth workers, you know, to, to, uh, match the selling point that we purported <laughs> before the birth. So, um, I, w- I could feel myself rising in that tension of, of almost feeling dehumanized and, um, just recognizing everything that was wrong with birth. 
Um, and of course there were beautiful moments too, but I could feel my, in my body, like there was this sense of draining and, um, loss and disconnection and of like, a, I can't do this anymore. That a gate of great doubt, which I know you're familiar with that terminology from birthing from within or likely familiar. Mm-hmm. Um, in any case, this is my <laughs> slightly longer version, but hopefully it'll relate back to our topic at hand. Um, I connected with a birth worker, a midwife in my San Diego community where I've lived my whole life mostly. Um, and Nicole Morales, she's a spinning babies trainer and a birthing from within mentor. Um, and we were just sitting in a park. I mean, some, some of us are called to birth and we have those little moments that are so gradual that it's hard to pinpoint an actual, oh, this is when I found my new paradigm or this is when I, you know, something shifted for me. And I remember the huge shift I had sitting in a park with Nicole and another friend. And she just, I was complaining about, you know, how hard birth work is. And she asked me a question that no one had ever asked me before. And it wasn't even the question. It was almost like the tone and the openness and the compassion that she held for me in that moment. Um, that I could almost feel like, oh, this is what is missing from birth. This like self-compassion, this self-love. And then the question she asked me was, when did you witness your client birth herself as a mother? You know, even all these other things were happening, the epidural she didn't want it and um, the forced cervical exam at two centimeters, you know, like all the things, right, that I'm complaining about. And she asked me this question, right, that just like, whew, that just shifted what I, I knew was possible in being in relationship to birth and being support for someone in birth, right? This is the power of a new type of question. And I wasn't even sure what was different, but I could feel myself um, knowing I couldn't go back, <laughs> that this was, this was a way forward that was beyond just the outcomes of birth. And those are important. Of course, those are important. And I don't want to condone all the things again that are wrong with, um, the birth world, but having these new maps, which I'll, I believe I'll talk about in a little bit, having this new, um, mindset from which to ask questions that's curious and focused on process and, um, on the integrity of our clients, you know, psyche that were, um, that, that shifted how I saw myself as a birth worker, mm-hmm. not someone who would just get someone the outcome they want, but someone who was a guardian of their psycho spiritual experience. Mm-hmm. Like this big. Yeah. So for the rest of my journey, I mean, it, it took me different places. I had the foundation in body work and manual therapy and touch. So, um, I think it was that, you know, right after that, that park moment, I started attending a storytelling, healing storytelling in the birth workers journey workshop that Nicole has put on and, um, a few times over the last decade or so. And, um, that brought me into birthing from within, which I just did a huge crash course at the time. I just consumed everything, um, that they had to offer at the time because it was so resonant, um, and then about the same time, I also discovered spinning babies and from the outside, you know, spinning babies can look like most people find spinning babies because their baby is in a breech position or their baby sideways and they're pregnant and they want to do things to help this baby be head down or people find spinning babies because they are having um, a, a stall or some challenge and labor. So they look up really quickly what to do when baby's at a certain station. And so that, that from the outside, it can seem like, I think that spinning babies is, um, is purely like physiological, but, um, I'm kind of going into what I want to talk about later, but just as a little, <laughs> a little seed being planted of, of some of our points of discussion, um, I quickly discovered that a lot of the spinning babies practices and concepts and principles, we can bring a sense of how, like how we are doing a forward leaning inversion, for example, um, can, can build a certain type of mindset in us of relationship rather than, okay, I'm going to do the forward leaning inversion because that's going to get my baby head down so I can have the birth of my dreams, right? Rather than like this outcome, this checklist kind of thing. 
So it's somewhat paradoxical. Um, both approaches, I think, embrace paradox <laughs> in a beautiful way. Um, so yeah, back to my, my journey. Um, I've done childbirth education classes and doula work, and now I'm a birthing from within. I'm part of the birthing from within facilitator team. So I'm now training and supporting and mentoring those who are called to the doula path and those called to educating or called to, you know, the birth attendant path, birthing from within also trains midwives or anybody that's connected with birth. Um, and then I simultaneously, uh, landed in a, position after becoming a Spinning Babies Aware practitioner, which is there's a listing on their website of people that do some kind of body work, touch, massage, or at least have more um, training in that in that realm, right? Just to, to serve clients, to serve all kinds of clients. Um, so I became that practitioner. And then after even deeper dives into anatomy and putting this work into practice, particularly for people that have babies that are position breach. So parents to be whose babies are breach and they want to there that that's like <laughs> talk about being thrown into your own, you know, another labyrinth. Um, they, they meet the, the unknown in pregnancy <laughs> often that other parents whose babies are head down and the pregnancy is smooth often don't meet until they're in their moments of birth. So it's an opportunity to, um, so I, I was already, as I was doing these, what we call breach body balancing sessions, I was already integrating the, um, importance of, you know, the, the protection and guardianship of their psycho spiritual experience a matched with their physiological experience. Mm -hmm. um, so that I feel like has been, you know, helpful in some way. Some babies turn when I work, when I work with them. Sometimes they don't. Um, sometimes they turn and we have no idea if it was me or their acupuncturist or their chiropractor, or just what baby wanted to do that week, right? There's a yeah. lot of beautiful powerlessness um, with this work. But I think it's still worthwhile because yeah. I don't, especially if we're not outcome focused, it's absolutely worthwhile because of the relationship that we model right. with these people we're working with. Yeah. And so anyway, that's, yeah. And then we wrote a book, <laughs> <laughs> tried to anchor a lot of these concepts, Nicole Morales and I. Uh, wrote a book. Amazing. All right. So I'm, that was a great explanation, but now let's dive a little bit into and more of an understanding. So I mentioned spinning babies. You talked a little about that birthing within now two very different approaches to childbirth and childbirth education. But again, I think they complement one another. Of course, you know, I'm biased because I've studied both, but before we dive deeper, can you just give a little background on each of their approach and their philosophy? Yeah. So being so deep in both practices, I feel like I need an hour. <laughs> like give like your elevator pitch of right, each. <laughs> right. So then I, so I was contemplating like what is, if I had to just say it in, you know, 30 seconds or 10 seconds. And so the biggest, broadest kind of um, definition or summary, like to sum up what the organization is about or what the approach is about um, is similar to what I mentioned in <clears throat> when I was speaking earlier um, that birthing from within is, is a holistic and, um, emotional and mental and physical, um, container for the birth experience. And it honors birth as a rite of passage, as a journey of transformation rather than just an obstetrical or medical event, right? So it's, um, holding sacred that, um, that framework of compassion and that framework of self-love. And that's the goal, right? The goal is this, this path of self-discovery. If that, I guess that's sort of the paradox of being outcome focused around it being <laughs> self-discovery and spinning babies, as I mentioned before, from the outside, it can seem like it's purely physiological. And that I think is how spinning babies was birthed. Um, Gail Tully, who is the founder of spinning babies, a midwife in Minneapolis, um, was just starting to ask different questions about the body and birth. And she came up with many ideas and also with the, um, contributions of many body workers and birth workers in, in her community and around the world, um, started to find this like helpful system 
of how people can find more comfort and ease or might possibly find those elements in their pregnancies and in their labor and beyond. Um, so it felt like, it feels like when I think about both approaches, um, you know, how the yin has a little bit of yang in it and the yang has a little bit of yin in it, right? It almost feels like the entry point into this transformative relationship with birth for birthing from within is the overall holistic context, right? The psychological and spiritual container, but there's physiology in there because the the mind and the body are connected and the spinning babies approach seems very focused on the body and things you can do practically. Um, but there's that element of, um, of the personal and, and emotional and mental right state. Cause you can't separate that either. <laughs> so there are two different approaches that I think land at the exact same spot. And over the years I've seen, I, you know, I feel that I had this, the same feeling in my body when I'm guiding someone through a sideline release that I have when I'm in dialogue with parents through the birthing from within approach, you may be having a certain type of um, deep conversation with them. Like it's the same feeling in my body. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so that's a very broad, I think, difference between those two approaches. So how do you draw from each of those methodologies that you incorporate into your childbirth education classes? Because they really are, they they have similarities, but they also have you know, differences. Yeah. So if you were to examine or think about a typical childbirth education class, you know, usually someone will talk about the nuts and bolts of labor, what to expect with anatomy and physiology, what's typical, some things, um, some medical technology that might be a part of someone's birth and the advantages and disadvantages of those. Um, you might learn some ways to cope with pain, um, or ways to avoid pain (laughs) and, um, yeah, that, that tends to be sort of the typical framework for childbirth education classes. And often they are based on an outcome, right? It's like, if you do this method, then you will like be more likely to have a quote unquote natural birth or an unmedicated birth, or you do this method and you won't feel pain during your labor, during your birth. So there's, um, there's that kind of outcome focused approach that we're very much inundated with in birth in our culture. And the birthing from within approach is the exact opposite of that. It's like the, as we'll probably talk about a little bit more, the process is more important than the outcome. And these cl- the classes reflect that. So it's kind of like you've probably heard, many of us have, have heard, you know, that the, if you have all the information, if you know all your options, then it's more empowering right? You don't know your options until you have all the information about it. And birthing from within takes that a step further by saying, really, if you don't know your own relationship to the information, then it won't be empowering. Mm. So it is, it is very much a practice of digging deeper, of knowing, of, of exploring your inner knowing, the way that you know something to be true or not to be true. Because in birth, even if you've had hours, let's say you you for some reason you saw on business of being born, however long ago that movie <laughs> came out, you saw on business of being born that epidurals um have all kinds of you know side effects that that go along with having that particular medication. And you're like, I don't want to have an epidural, I don't want to have an epidural. And intellectually, you're super on board for that. And you're taking the classes that tell you, yeah, you know, these are things you can do to avoid having an epidural. Um, but if you, let's say, have this inner story that if I'm making a lot of noise in labor, I might, my, my family might look down upon me because they sure made fun of my sister mm. who, who gave, made a lot of noise during labor. Right. And so that, that deeper layer of what's influencing our choices in the moment is going to show up in labor, right? The moment comes, you want to maintain relationship with your family and feel like you belong and that you're loved and seen and not made fun of like your sister was. So you're going to pick the epidural so you don't make noise rather than, you know, the intellectual um, training that we had around, okay, here's what epidurals do. Here's what goes along with them. 
here's what you can do to avoid them. Here's all their side effects, right? So it's very informational rather than focused on the person um, and their, their unique preparation, right? The, the, what will uniquely serve them in preparation. Um, no, I like that. And because as you were talking about that, that is, it resonated with me a lot. So when I teach childbirth ed, I do, I pulled something from Birthing Within, but a lot about, like you said, the relationship with the information, as well as I call it digging into the closet, because I learned early as a doula that we need to address fears, because if we don't ahead of time, they show up smack dab in the middle of labor and we know what that's going to do. It's going to cause some problems. So I think that's why Birthing Within really spoke to me is it asks you to do that deeper work ahead of time. Not that it's going to necessarily resolve anything. Those fears could very much still be there, but (laughs) the the skeletons have been pulled out of the closet and they're like sitting next to you instead of hiding in there. They're like, they're, you're kind of going on with, with each other. So that's something that I've pulled when I do those, my childbirth, that is, it's not just informational, which I do think is important. So, cause how can you make a decision if you don't know where it's coming from? But then we take it deeper and that's what's like, that's what I find exciting. And that's where I find people can then make either different decisions or understand their decisions and then can share it with their team. And then it's more of a team effort. Does that make any sense? It does. You've taken it even a step further in that we're not birthing in isolation. We're birthing in a community. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that certainly you're giving birth, but you're, if you're, if you're partnered, your partner's giving birth and your family is giving them birth to themselves or, you know, someone's giving birth to themselves as a grandparent, maybe for the first time or your neighbor is giving birth, right? They're, they're, they're giving birth to their new relationship with their neighbor who now has a baby. Yeah. Right. So it's, it is, I, I love that you brought that to the, the community element. Well, because um, those that are supporting the birth, if they can mm-hmm. understand also where the birthing person's fears come, they can be ready to not, again, not resolve them, but acknowledge them and help them walk with the fear instead of pretending it doesn't exist, which will probably not have a great outcome if we're like, nope, nope, that's not there. Nope, nope. I'm going to pretend it's not there. <laughs> that's just my take on it. That's no, that's exactly right. That's like, or right. As in, I see your point. Like yeah. it's the validation of, of the, the person who's, you know, preparing for their birth, validating exactly where they're at. Yeah. Right. There isn't, there isn't anything necessarily to fix. Mm-hmm. And once we have done that validating and once we have dug deeper, then we can add that education piece. Um, and I find that, you know, this, the spinning babies work can have this quality of truly validating the body exactly where it is. So if someone's going to try one of the three balances or they feel like they want to move more or be in relationship to gravity more, that it can have this soft quality of them being aware of their body without judging it, Mm -hmm. that it's an opportunity, right. To just learn more, um, and maybe bring some more balance, but not a prescription necessarily that these are like invitations. Yeah. I know Gail often says invitations. And yet I also Mm -hmm. feel like a lot of people do look at as a prescription, like, okay, I'm going to do my forward leaning inversion, you know, whenever I'm supposed to and three breaths and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I'm going to have someone do my jiggle and all that. And then there can be a surprise when there's still some stalling, but that's, so I want to go, in, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I want to go into that a little bit more. We're going to take a quick break. Okay. When we come back, let's talk about the idea of process focused rather than outcome focused. Cause I think we were just starting to touch on that. Okay. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back. With Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. (gasps) No, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Judy was boring. Hello. Then Judy discovered Chumbacasino.com. It's my little escape. Now Judy's the life of the party. Oh, baby. Mama's bringing home the bacon. Whoa. Take it easy, Judy. <laughs> 
Chumba. The Chumba life is for everybody. So go to ChumbaCasino.com and play over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumba. ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Okay, we are back. All right, so let's dive into that. So can you talk a little bit about how birthing from within and spinning babies are often more process focused rather than outcome focused because we think about birth there is an outcome we're looking for yeah we want a, right. a, we want, the baby obviously comes out we've never left one in but we'd like them to come out um non traumatized for anyone involved so so yeah cuz i understand like we can't necessarily influence birth and you know we we can influence it we can influence the birth process but we we can't control it it's like this wild river that we just kind of have to ride along being process focused is an incredibly powerful thing um it can liberate us to be truly present to what the next moment might need if we are settled in and attached to a certain outcome or an outcome that we're replaying in the past that we wish went a different way, then we are pulled right to the past or we are pulled to the future and what we're anticipating and anxious about um, and just, you know, holding tight to that particular outcome that we're hoping for. Whereas if we can step into that invitation for being in the process of the moment, there is so much freedom there again, to do exactly what this moment needs. So, a lot of the childbirth preparation with birthing from within, and I think with spinning babies as well, is an invitation to being in the process, is an invitation to noticing your body exactly how it is when you are doing um, a three bal- one of the three balances or some of the other practices that are recommended. Um, and in our birthing from within classes, most of the time, just depending on the mentor and how they uh, like to structure their classes or what they're really called to. And, um, most of the time we like to include some practices, mindfulness practices that include using ice, Mm. right? So the, are you familiar with the ice holding? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. (laughs) So in the same way that we can bring that awareness of what is happening with our body. If we're doing the three balances, we also bring that same quality of awareness, um, and curiosity to these different mindfulness practices that we can you share the ice cube experience with our listeners? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so one of the gifts of preparation is the opportunity to learn about how your unique mind looks for a way out of a situation, the way our minds will rush and dance and jump around and create stories around how our experience, um, what our experience means about us. Like, oh my gosh, I'm such a failure at this. Oh my gosh, I've been doing this labor for 10 hours and I'm only two centimeters. That means I probably have like 10 more hours till I get to four. I can't do this. I can't do this. Right. So the stories that spiral in our head are often what bring us into a place of trauma or freeze or um, not being able to cope more than just the sensation of the experience itself, right? So doing a practice where we hold ice for about a minute just to mimic the length of time and not to mimic an, uh, a real labor contraction because it's nothing like holding ice at all, but it's uncomfortable, right? Holding ice generally is not pleasant for most people, and it kind of can even stir up a little physiology, right, of uh, of avoidance or discomfort. And so we have that opportunity when we're holding the ice to make friends with, oh, okay, I see my mind like comparing. So the, you know, the parent next to me, it seems really relaxed and I seem like really tense. So that's a way I could get into story around what's, what might be happening in my layers. I compare or somebody else might be just really focused on the time and might be telling them the story. Oh my gosh, Jamie's not the going way over a minute. This has felt like three minutes. <laughs> this isn't okay. Um, if I can't do this, how am I going to cope with labor? Right? So there's all these wonderful opportunities for the ways that our, um, 
our mind like wants to get the hell out of the experience <laughs> and it's slightly uh masochistic you know to to put ourselves in this uncomfortable situation but it's low stakes you know you, you just drop the ice that that's okay um and labor is a lot different too because we have um hormones of labor flowing that totally change our or can change our perception of sensation. So it doesn't even have a bearing on if you're able to hold the ice, then you'll probably do be able to cope with the intensity of labor. No, it's an opportunity again to be in awareness around your body and to build on what's working. So that's where we introduce practices like breath awareness or non-focused awareness or a bunch of others. You know, there's specific practices that bring us into a state of mindfulness so that our more frantic minds, you know, that are telling ourselves um, stories about what's how terrible we are as a person or a parent or a mother, and um, they land us back into, okay, what's actually happening in this moment? Um, and so that might increase. I mean, it might, in a way, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if that influences um, whether someone has a cesarean or not. There's so many factors that are often, again, as you mentioned, beyond our control um, around birth, but it can it can definitely build that muscle of resilience, build that that muscle within that that um, ability to, to have self love in the moment, because it is a disconnect from ourselves or from mm-hmm. our babies or from our partners that creates birth trauma. So, I see being process focused as actually some of the greatest trauma prevention out there. Um, so one of the, one of the ways that I feel like the process focused approach in spinning babies comes to, to, comes to bear. I wanted to share an example. Um, so with spinning babies, we talk about the three levels of the pelvis and those that have ever attended a spinning babies workshop, you get very excited because they're like, oh, there's the inlet. And the one who's giving birth might assume certain positions or there's actually positions and releases that can help the baby navigate that inlet. And then the same thing for the mid pelvis. And then the same thing for the outlet, right? As baby's making their way through, there's all these strategies and possibilities that we can do beyond just, um, you know, medication and epidurals and rest, right? So it's very exciting. And it's also can be more process focused if we take that knowledge, we take that, that those concepts of physiology that we learned in a workshop and we apply them to absolutely validate and observe what is happening in the labor. So if, for example, this is kind of a classic example, someone is clearly pushing, maybe, maybe it's even low, right? Is quote unquote in the outlet, maybe it's pretty close, right? Um, but suddenly the one who's giving birth starts to go naturally into these positions that one might think would be more appropriate for if their baby was higher up, if their baby's like in the inlet. And so the the temptation would be, especially if one is like new to a lot of these concepts would be like, wait a minute, outlet, they should be having their knees together and their ankles apart, you know, internally rotating to open up the outlet. And they might say, let's try this position. I know, you know, you seem to be wanting to do that, but I don't think that's going to be helpful. We need to do this position. However, if we approach it through the process, if we pro- approach it through validating the body is exactly exactly what it's doing in that moment or the person, what they're saying and doing and experiencing in that moment, we might step back and observe and say, huh, maybe they, they naturally want to do inlet positions. They're not just doing it to be <laughs> um, contrary. contrary. Yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, there's a reason. And so sometimes um, Nicole Morales has talked about there might be another part of the baby, maybe a shoulder, that is navigating the inlet. That is asking the birther, like, hey, you need to make a little space right here. <laughs> That's right. How do both birthing from within and spinning babies value asking different questions? I mean, if we take a, we back up and take a look at the maps that are provided to us culturally how, about how to get from point A to point B, how to get from your start of your labor to the baby being here, right? There's all different kinds of maps. In fact, there's, you know, the map to the literal map in your GPS on your phone or 
because people print out their directions <laughs> anymore, right? Your actual map of how to get from your home to your birth location. Or maybe you're even mapping out in your home where you're going to put your birth pole for your planned home birth, right? Where we can have this sort of physical map that many of us are doing. But we know it's not enough. We know that's just one map that can be part of our preparation. And over the years, um, well, yeah, of course, there's thousands of years ago, hundreds of thousands of years ago, and there, there was just being in the physiology and less story, less, op, less distractions, less, um, ways that were pulled into story. You just do what needs to be done. I, I, I think, um, that, that type of ancient way of being in our bodies. But then particularly for the U in the U S particularly in the 1950s, there were some maps that have influenced birth in the U S um, as you're probably familiar with and throughout the, throughout the world. Um, there is a map of Friedman's curve mm -hmm. where the X axis or the horizontal axis is time and the vertical axis is the centimeters of dilation. And so this was measured in the 1950s by a doctor named Dr. Friedman um, to support a colleague in determining how much anesthesia um, to be used. That, cause that, that doctor wanted to know how much the person is, how much do people typically dilate? You know, how quickly do people typically dilate? And um, they created this little map that was, you know, started off kind of slow um, a half a centimeter every few hours. And then at some point, usually four, five, six centimeters, it became a centimeter every hour or so. And then the baby was born. That was the average. So there were, of course, all different kinds of ways that um, people would give birth. There were other people that took a very, very long time to dilate to different um, centimeters and they still birthed their baby. And there were people that were had a quicker or higher, faster trajectory and their babies were born. But this average over time came to mean normal. And this map was put on a pedestal as a way to measure people's progress. Even now, I think we are influenced by that particular map. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also the map, right, of cervical dilation. Sometimes you've probably seen on the internet little pictures of the Cheerio to represent zero or half a centimeter. Um, and then a button to represent one centimeter, right? And just kind of the cervix marching along to like a tennis ball that's 10 centimeters. I don't even know if tennis balls are 10 centimeters, but you know, some <laughs> like of the bigger like round. I don't think so. <laughs> Grapefruit. That's kind Grapefruit. Of there you go. Yeah. Um, and that's another map, right? That we internalize that is part of our subconscious and sometimes conscious guidance. Um, and in particular, those two maps are cervical centric maps meaning the cervix. What is the cervix doing? How much is that birthing person dilated? Is sort of that pair, the, the, the paramount <laughs> um, distinction of whether labor is progressing or not, right? This is the thing everybody's kind of focused on or have been at least for the past many decades. And this dilation is of course important, but we know that's not we, we are knowing as we ask new questions, we are learning that there is so much more going on with the body and labor rather, rather than this like easily measurable, easy to chart and graph and make medical decisions um, map. And this is where we come to, you know, Gail's, um, Gail Tully, the founder of Spinning Babies, her, her big insight of actually where in the pelvis mm -hmm. is the baby? Because the baby's position can one influence dilation, um, and if the baby's you know is is or higher inhibit. In the, or inhibit, of course, yes, <laughs> yes. Um, or if the baby's high in the pelvis, uh, even they're, if they're fully dilated, like there's still a lot more work to go. Um, so just that question, right? This new question: Where's baby in the pelvis? And what, like, even noticing from a broader physiological perspective, what's the labor pattern telling mm -hmm. us, right? What is the, and that opens up other questions, like, what are the sounds this person is making? Um, what positions are they naturally going into, right? So we, we, we shift from just being focused on the cervix to a broader validation of the physiology. Um, and that is just that, that idea of asking new questions again, connects beautifully with the birthing from within approach 
um, whose map, I, one of the main maps of birthing from within is the labyrinth. And you're probably familiar with yes. the yeah. labyrinth and birthing from within. It's, it's such a powerful map for, for our framework that it's the logo, you know, <laughs> of birthing from within. Um, and we also use stories, you know, great stories. Can I say myth- one thing about the labyrinth that I just love? So yeah. if people don't realize it's a labyrinth, that it can look like a maze. But what I love about a labyrinth is like a maze, because my kids have all these maze books. You can hit a dead end and you're like, oh, I have to go back up. And then my daughter's like, I did it with pen. I can't do it anyway. But with a labyrinth, you always get to the center. Like there's no wrong turn per se. And I just think that's so beautiful for birth that there's no, like you're, you're doing it the right way for you. And I think sometimes we put on this idea of like, I have to do birth in the right way or how Mm -hmm. so-and-so did it or how my mother-in-law told me I should do it. Like that's the beauty of the labyrinth that you will get to the center. Then you got to get out, which is a whole nother part of birthing (laughs) birth that I love, but, (laughs) but it all, it always gets you there. If you keep going, if you keep trudging the next step, the next step, you always get there. And that's something that speaks to me. Oh, for sure. That, I mean, talk about being process focused. <laughs> All you have to do is the next step. The next step the next and then breath, the next step. Yeah. The next contraction. And labyrinths by design are inherently disorienting, right? Particularly a As walking labor. labyrinth. <laughs> and by design, that also, right? We know our brainwaves change. Yeah. And a labyrinth, people that trace, trace labyrinths or walk them, their brainwaves change. So it's an incredibly holistic map for preparation for birth um, that really honors beyond just the physical experience as you highlighted so beautifully. Um, yeah. So these, (laughs) and then of course a great story, right? The myth, um, birthing from within, or at least Pam's most recent book, ancient map for modern birth. I mean, there's the title right there. This is a, a new map or an ancient map. Um, she uses the story, the myth of Inanna, the oh descent God, of Inanna. It's one of my all-time favorite stories ever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, there's so many layers to it, and we could hear it. I've probably heard it and told it hundreds of times, and I still hear and connect with something different that is relevant to me in that moment, right? So there again, we're just um, back to being being grounded in the process, right? Um So that, those stories are wonderful maps. And yeah, I guess what I want to circle back around to is how, just like with a labyrinth, it's one step in the next, just like when we're thinking about the baby coming through the labyrinth of the pelvis, Mm -hmm. you know, literally, um, it's just one little shift. And then the next, that part of being focused on, um, on process and also focused on solutions, right? Rather than problems is that we, it's just, we slice it really thin and it's just a small amount. All right. We're going to take another break. When we come back, if you have one final tip or piece of advice, you'd like to offer new and expectant parents. All right. Chew on that for a moment. We'll be right back. Lucky Land Casino, asking people, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car, before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Okay, we're back. So what do you want to leave us with? So one thing I would like to offer new and expectant parents, one little bit, one little nugget that I think could be helpful um, to bring your preparation into a place of more process and solution um, and groundedness is to ask some, as we've been talking about throughout this podcast, ask yourself some different questions. So you might be naturally drawn to certain books. You might be naturally drawn to movies and a certain way that you're imagining your birth. You want it to be just a simple question like, 
how do I know to do this, to read this particular book or to take this particular, particular class? How do I know to want a home birth or a cesarean, right? Just asking how we know to believe something about birth or to believe something about bodies or about pain. How do we know can help us settle into a deeper layer um, that can unearth some of the things that we might meet when we meet the unknown in labor and in birth. So just making more of a practice of cultivating that inner knowing because in our <laughs> in our birth world there is so much modern knowing stuffed down our faces or actively sought out right there's tons of information but if that information doesn't land on a honest fertile heart um, then it's just information in the head mm-hmm. so I would kind of close with so two of my favorite quotes um, are by Pam England and by Gail Tully And Pam's quote is, we give birth in our body, not in our head. And I've I've heard that years and years ago, and I just use it as a mantra. And then a while ago as well, I heard Gail Tully say, there's only room for one head in the pelvis, and it's not the one giving birth. (laughs) (laughs) So where can people find your work? And I know that you're presenting at the Spinney's Babies Confluence. So what are you presenting? Yeah, so I'm really honored to be doing a presentation with two spinning babies trainers and midwives um, who are local to San Diego with me, Emma Moreland and Nicole Morales. We created a presentation on birth trauma, prevention, presence, and restoration is the title of our presentation. So it's um, essentially conversation that we're all having around this topic, similar to maybe how one might listen to a podcast that we hope will offer some, in addition to some little specific nuggets about how to prevent or work with people that have had some kind of trauma in their birth, um, to also bring that to yourself, right. And honor the birth workers journey, how we need witnessing and compassionate listening as well. Um, so we're, yeah, we're excited for that to be viewed and participated in, um, I, you can find me at Jamie Mose, my full name.com, or I'm on so, some social media at Jamie Mose, my full name again. And we're actually doing for the first time in person in like three years, a crossing the threshold retreat oh, in San Diego. Yeah. In November 18th, November 18th through 20th here, um, so the crossing the threshold retreat is like the the in person workshop that's sort of an introduction to some of the concepts of birthing from within, but for yourself as the birth worker before bringing that to parents. Um, and then we have a bunch of aware practitioner workshops coming up in 2023. So Emma, Nicole, and I again will be facilitating in San Diego, April 20th and 23rd. And then Emma and I are going to be traveling to North Carolina about a week later. Um, to do the same. Amazing. Training. I have That's a lot one. of fond memories of the, the crossing the threshold training I did. So gosh, it feels like my world, I'm sure as many of us is like before pandemic, after pandemic, like it's just like the world pre pandemic. I'm like, when was that three years ago, four years ago, I did that, but it was just, it was lovely. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really, really enjoyed this conversation. Likewise, Deb. Thank you. This has been an episode of Yoga Birth Babies, produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. You can catch us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Periscope. I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Thanks for listening. With lucky landslots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. No, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.